we will use the EV real-time rendering engine for our model. For those who are unaware, Blender has two rendering methods. The first is cycle, which is the method of rendering with ray tracing that is as close to reality as possible. After that, there is the real-time rendering engine. Of course, the advantage is that if I activate the final rendering view, this is much faster. Then, as it would be for cycle, we can work without having to wait a long time. In this course, we will only use the fundamental settings. We won't alter them from what is typically done. So, once EV is activated, we can increase the viewport samples to 32 for a more optimized rendering with less noise. I'm going to enable ambient occlusion so we can see contact shadows and have a better sense of three-dimensionality. Instead, we will not activate other properties, such as screen space reflection, because it can produce unpredictable results. But, once again, we don't need it for this lesson. If we want, we can turn on Bloom, which produces a brighter effect in areas with a lot of light. For the rest, we could leave all of the settings at their default values. The only other thing I want to do is enable a HDR background image in both the material preview and the rendering mode so that we have as realistic lighting as possible. Instead of loading a HDR image into the world settings, we can now use the global illuminations that are already present in Blender. So, in render mode, click the arrow here on the right and uncheck the world scenes checkbox. This means using the default lighting settings rather than any lighting settings defined in the world. Click here to view a variety of lighting maps, including near sunset lighting, night lighting, and others with more saturated hues. In this case, I'm using the first one to best illuminate the material and see it as it appears in reality. This is a much more neutral lighting setting, much more uniform, and thus ideal for evaluating our material without being influenced by external colorations. If you use the attached file, Texture Painting Start, you should use the same settings. When we enter viewport shading, everything is white because we haven't yet associated a material. So let's get started on this lighting map. In addition, I'm going to enable ambient occlusion in the EV settings. The first step is to develop a new material for our object. So let's select it. Then, go to the Materials section and create a new material there. We'll call it Metal. At this point, we switch to the Shading mode to work on the material's nodes. Enable the Viewport Shading using the settings we saw earlier. Another thing I recommend is importing a reference image into Blender. That way, we can keep an eye on the material that will inspire us. So, if we go to the Textures folder, we'll find this as our reference material. The image can then be dragged directly into the viewport. As you can see, Blender automatically creates an image containing the material that we imported. We can now move it wherever we want by pressing the G key just like we would with any other object. We can also change the size. As a result, we must keep it in a convenient location so that we can always keep an eye on the reference material. Now select the object, and we're back in the node view with the starting material. I recommend that you always work with materials in the node view rather than the panel on the right. This increases flexibility and the ability to create complex materials, such as the ones we're seeing now. For those who have not yet used notes, I will now provide a brief overview. Materials in Blender are essentially built from this basic node, known as the principal shader. It contains all of the basic settings that define a material. It is a node that has been specifically designed to have all of the primary features that define a physically correct material. In fact, we have properties like base color, specularity, and roughness. It represents the presence of surface imperfections and how rough the surface should be. Then, there's the reflection index, transmission, and everything else needed to define a physically correct material. 
The inputs are represented by the dots on the left. So, for each of these elements, you can connect another node that will control their properties. As a result, I can use the slider to increase or decrease a setting. You can also connect another node to define the properties of each of these elements. But we'll go over that in detail later in the course. The first step is to define two fundamental properties of any material. The first one is the base color. There is also a material's intrinsic property which determines whether it should be metallic or dielectric. This is a fundamental principle. With a few exceptions, any material can be divided into these categories. Most of the objects we can handle are made of dielectric materials. As an example, consider plastic, wood, a wall, or anything else. There are also metallic materials. We can define how the material should behave with this slider, as we will see later. But first, I'd like to define the base color. So I'm going to click here and use the color picker to select the desired color. So you can see how helpful it is to have the image I want to be inspired by in the scene. Let's sample the base color. I recommend selecting a color that is neutral and not too reflective. Otherwise, the color would be altered due to light reflection. So I choose a neutral area such as this one. We can also reduce the ambient light a little to improve our vision. The second step, as previously stated, is to define the type of material. It can be dielectric, and in this case, we have to set the metallic property equal to zero. Or it can be metallic. In our case, it is obviously a metallic material. I'm going to set this property to one. The material's appearance completely alters, as you can see. From a material that resembles plastic to one that behaves much more like metal. In order to avoid producing unreliable materials, I must emphasize a very important point right now. The metallic property should never be set to a middle value, in my opinion. So, despite the fact that it is possible, consider that a natural material is either dielectric or metallic. As a result, it's either 0 or 1. There is no in-between. There are no materials that are partially dielectric and partially metallic. The other important element that we can change is specularity. In this case, there is not much change, as it can be observed better if we have direct lights. If there are no direct lights, we do not have areas of high brightness. The other essential parameter is roughness. It defines how smooth or rough a surface is. This is critical because it defines how light is reflected from the material. If we set a roughness of zero, the material behaves almost like a mirror. So it reflects its surroundings perfectly. This is because the surface is perfectly smooth, so light is reflected perfectly. What happens in a mirror? If we increase the roughness, we are increasing the surface imperfections. The material is no longer perfectly smooth, but it has texture. It's as if we start with a surface that is perfectly smooth and then use sandpaper to ruin it. As a result of these surface imperfections, light is no longer reflected specularly, but rather in all directions. This is an important property because it will help us distinguish between areas that are already smooth and thus behave more like a mirror. And others, such as areas with rust, which should instead have less reflective behavior. These are the fundamental properties of a physically correct material. Other factors, such as transmission, subsurface scattering, and so on, are also present but we are not interested in them at this time. These are the basic properties of our material, on top of which we will add the various subsequent layers that we will see in subsequent episodes.